Hi, and welcome to the special coronavirus version of the Flying Focus Retrospective Show, the 29th bus anniversary. I'm Dan Hamlin. And I'm PC Perry. I co-founded Flying Focus Video Collective in 1991. I've been recording video with FFBC for 29 years, including during the pandemic. This year, I recorded uh, or contributed footage to 11 of the 14 programs. Two shows featured video from online Zoom presentation. And I reported the remaining show. Uh, people got together during the so-called Gulf War to create a space for voices not heard on mainstream television from people who oppose war and promote justice. We look at topics like environmental justice, animal rights, and economic equality. Flying Focus has created a thousand programs featuring lectures, forums, interviews, protests, and other actions that aren't covered elsewhere. On this show, oh. we will share uh, clips from 25 episodes of the weekly Flying Focus video bus, which are contained in 14 programs produced between November 2019 and October 2020. Uh, each year on our video bus, our bus anniversary show, our volunteers come out from behind the scenes in front of the cameras to tell you, our audience, what motivated us to make our shows and to remind you that anyone can make video. If you want to join us or support us, call 503-239-7456 or call or text 503-321-5051. You can also email us at ffbc at flyingfocus.org. At the time this show is airing, there's a strong movement for Black Lives while the White House seems to be encouraging white supremacists. Our coverage is important to hold back the full on realization of creeping fascism. Watch these clips and see if you agree. Like PC, I was one of the co-founding members of Flying Focus in 1991. This year I produced six programs, recording one of those for the camcorder and another using Zoom. I edited part of all 14 shows. Some of the shows involved as many as four or five of us working together. The first two shows are among five we did this year about civil rights and police accountability. This first one was recorded by PC as we followed the 2020 Martin Luther King Day March in January for five miles from a park in North Portland, to the MLK statue at the convention center. You can hear among the chants many slogans which came into prominence about four months after this event with the death of George Floyd, including marchers saying, we can't breathe. These issues have been going on for a long time before the summer 2020 uprising. Marchers were young and old, included black, white, and Latino community members. Among the many signs were some that reminded people that to honor King, we need to end racism. The event was coordinated by Don't Shoot Portland. In one of the clips, you can see that group founder, Teresa Rayford, supporting those singing for justice.
Police Accountability Show featured footage from Zoom and YouTube of the annual memorial for Pete and Otis, who was shot and killed by three Portland police officers in May 2010. It was coordinated by the Justice for Pete and Otis Committee, which provided us the footage. You'll hear from a number of speakers, including local author, lecturer, Walida Imarisha, City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, father of another PPD shooting victim, Joe Bean Keller, and Keaton's sister, Alicia Bryant. It closes with a song from Marilyn Keller. If you watch the whole show, you'll see other speakers, including me in my role as a member of Portland Cop Watch, clips from the early 2010s of Keaton's father, Fred, Fred Bryant, who died from the stress of seeking justice, and more. This was a complicated show to edit as the sign language interpreter ended up on one live stream while the speakers were on another, so check it out. I want to welcome everyone to the 10 year memorial for Keaton Otis, a young black man who was murdered by Portland police. These are incredibly difficult times made catastrophic by structural inequalities and oppression. And it's important to recognize that wherever there is repression, there is resistance. And so we are coming here to mourn the loss of Keaton. We are coming here to honor him, and we are also here to imagine different futures and to build those into existence. In response to his murder, Keaton's father, Fred, began, began a monthly vigil at Northeast 6th and Halsey here in Portland. When Fred Bryan decided that he was going to go and stand on that street corner where he lost his son, that was a that was an act of courage. It was an act of courage because Fred was going to do it, even if it was just Fred standing on that corner. As a father of a son that was murdered by the police in 1996, 24 years later, I'm still standing strong and still fighting for change, basically, and other things that are going on. My son Deontay was, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he was shot in the back and murdered by Portland police officer Terry Kruger and on February 28th, 1996. You cannot look for justice from an unjust system. We must pry justice out of this system. And so then come Friday when we found out, I'd never forget how my father reacted that day. And I'll never forget how he reacted the next three years after that, fighting every day endlessly, um, hours upon hours into the night, going through thousands of papers, transcripts, everything, just tirelessly, slowly killing himself, trying to get justice. My father's mansion's many rooms have room for all of his children. As long as we do share his love and see that all are free. We're welcoming Ben on now uh, to tell us how he did with his editing of the George Floyd Memorial that was uh, recorded at the Terry Strong Plaza in Portland, Oregon. Uh, what did you do on that, uh, Ben? Uh, well, I just basically I received footage that you and uh, Cat Meow uh, had shot from the day and um, tried to put it together. Um, Kind of a collage of the signs that were around and uh, some of the there was a a, a die-in i think is what they called it where people Correct. were lay, laying in the streets right i think you showed very well what happened and uh, gave a good feel for the uh, mood of the day keep up the good work all right yeah i, I enjoyed doing it um Definitely, uh, I'm just, you know, trying to get more editing practice and then also um, support, you know, the, you know, the, the fight for justice for, you know, for all of us. They're raised, they're grown, they're taught. 
out. I didn't know back then, because I, I am the daughter, niece, and granddaughter of law enforcement officers, sheriffs and, and, and police officers and corrections officers. I didn't know then that other COs and police officers and sheriffs weren't like my daddy. We must end. We must end the war on drugs. We must end the war on sex work. We must end the war on the houseless. We must end mass incarceration. We must end broken windows policing. We must end militarization of the police force. Thousands of murders at the hands of state violence. They want you dead. They want you dead and me quiet. It would be easy for us today to say that this is a police problem. But I want to tell you that it is not a police problem. Police is a weapon, a tool that continues to be used to sacrifice black lives. It would be easy to say if we just train police better, black people wouldn't be dying every single day. But that would be wrong. The reality is, it is that white America has accepted the fact that black and brown bodies are uh, expendable. So we're welcoming Barabon now on Zoom, and uh, she did the editing for Beyond Policing with uh, Alex Vitali, I believe, who now people are hearing a lot about. Tell us about it, Barb. What was involved in your uh, production? Uh, well, I learned so much from this program. Um, I've been with uh, Flying Focus now for 25 years which I realized the other day is the longest I've ever been with anything. Um, and it's because of shows like this where I learned so much. Um, I, uh, you know, there's a whole movement about this now, but this guy has been doing this work for a long time. And he explains very clearly here um, why he believes we need to move beyond policing. President Obama's 2015 task force on 21st century policing recommended essentially the same suite of reforms as McGuckin did in 1943. That was 72 years ago. I think the time has come to stop talking about reforming the police. Uh, the institution cannot be reformed. It was built to do exactly what it does. The system is not broken, but rather is working very, very well. And the cycles of abuse, rebellion, analysis, reform, and then renewed legitimacy continue while police continue to be the tip of the spear against poor, black, brown, and queer communities and organized labor. So tonight I hope we can begin imagining how to create a world beyond policing. Between a quarter and half of all people killed by police in the United States are having a mental health crisis. And if we want to reduce that carnage, training is not the solution. We've been doing training, a lot of different kind of training regimes, and we have research that shows that it just does not work. It does not change the arrest rates. It does not change use of force rates. The few studies that show some positive impact are in those cities where the training has been combined with a dramatic expansion in community-based mental health resources. The legal formalists believe that the law is inherently beneficial to everyone that if we could just get everyone to follow the rules, that this will create a kind of level, neutral playing field that will allow civilization to flourish. But the law has never only, has never functioned primarily in this way. The law has always been a tool for the reproduction of inequalities and the enabling of regimes of exploitation. There's a famous 19th century saying that the law in its majesty forbids both the rich and the poor from sleeping under bridges, begging in the streets, and stealing bread. But of course, the rich don't need to do these things. The totally neutral professional enforcement of those laws, by their very nature, reproduces inequality. In this case, along lines of class. 
But of course, in the U.S., it's very hard to disentangle race and class. So this is uh, Voices for Black Lives. Uh, Barb edited it. She's here now to talk about it. And it was uh, recorded at the Justice Center and down at the Salmon Street Springs. Uh, two uh, reporters in the field, Lisa Stiller and uh, uh, Diana Rempe. This one um, pretty much restored my faith in humanity, which um, has been sliding lately. There were two different events. One was a walking meditation, and a lot of people had some very thoughtful and insightful things to say. And the other one, um, we see some speakers talking about current issues. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time. Um, never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. It's a, just a walking meditation. There's a Buddhist, um, a Buddhist group in Portland that gets together every Tuesday. We're not part of the group, but we saw the advertisement on social media and we decided to join it. Um, we thought it was a really peaceful way to show solidarity for what's going on. Um, I, I personally think there's incredible racial um, disparity in this country, and I think it's time that we really stand up and fight for it. For me, it's justice for um, specifically black lives that are being targeted by the police, as well as, honestly, um, just like a larger system that is not um, supporting the people. You know, I'm a teacher, I worked in the education system, and I feel like that is failing a lot of students and teachers. Um, and uh, not only that, but also like capitalism as a system in this country. Um, the, I mean, the democracy that we have, it's not a democratic system uh, because of the electoral college. Um, I just feel like there's multiple layers that are kind of uh, making it really difficult for people to actually live. The media is trying to, to once again put black people against other black people down here, saying that there are some violent ones and then there are some peaceful ones, right? And they're trying to create a dichotomy because they know that if we're together, we're stronger. things that we talk about when we talk about structural and systemic racism, it's baked into the system. Um, and then when you look at things like, um, you know, generational wealth and how that is uh, 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 developed, you, you've got things where, where you have white families that have 11 times as much net worth than black families. And that continues to push people further and further apart. It continues to uh, suppress and oppress uh, black populations for the benefit of white people. But, and again, again, that is goes to the structural and systemic racism. Coming up is the episode that Barb did with Ingrid Newkirk on uh, superheroes, animal superheroes. Uh, what did you learn, Barb? Uh, right, well, this is Ingrid Newkirk from PETA, and she's talking about some of the amazing things that animals can do and explaining why we shouldn't just use them uh, for our own needs without considering their intelligence and their feelings. She came in late to uh, Powell's to make this presentation and she wasn't sure she was gonna make it at all. She was feeling so sick, but uh, she came in, she stepped to the podium and did a great job. YouTube has videos of dogs who wait for their people to leave the house and then they push the chair up against the kitchen counter and they get on it and then they get on the kitchen counter <laughs> and then they open the cupboard and they take out whatever they want to eat and then they come back down and then they return the chair to where it was. <laughs> Years ago, there was a botanist in Asia who had trained a monkey to pick flowers for him. And, you know, up in the tree there would be something growing and he would send the monkey up to pick the flower. <coughs> so one day he's walking along what's basically a ravine with a sheer drop on the side, and he sees an orchid down there, and he tells the monkey, you know, go down, whatever the command was, go and get the orchid. And the monkey looks at the sheer drop, and he looks at the man, 
and he doesn't go. The man gets very angry and he orders him, you know, go and get the flower. And so the monkey looks over the side, finds what he wants and starts hand over hand to pull up the vine with the orchid on it, picks the orchid and hands it to the man. <laughs> who is the smarter of those two. The sheep, who is used in research, and we know this because they are, when they take their pulse rate, if a sheep is alone, if they tack up a picture of another sheep, the heart rate slows down and calms the sheep. So all these sheep, and I've been there and I've watched them shorn, and people say it's just a haircut, it is not a haircut they cut the bejesus out of them. And sometimes they take off a teat or an ear or something else. And they kick them down the chute when they finish shearing them. And they stand on their necks and they twist their heads and so on. So, you know, their little diversion there to say, please, anything that comes from an animal, wool, yes, wool, is it wasn't voluntarily surrendered. It was taken by force. McCarthyism versus uh, Clinton Jenks. Is it happening again? Yes, it is, as far as we know. People who are not familiar with what fascism is will find this a very good episode. Uh, Barbara Dudley interviewing uh, Raymond Caballero. Uh, what did you learn from this one, Barb? You edited it, right? Yeah, I did, and I, I learned a whole lot. Um... Uh, this is a very important um, case that went to the Supreme Court and has affected all of us since, and most people know nothing about it. Um, and here we see a little bit about what he's talking about. There was an incredible amount of desperation going on in this country. People wanted that thing fixed now. They remind me really of the people who think we must do something about climate change today, where you feel the urgency to do something. That's how they felt. So when young Clinton Jenks came on, what it was for him was Spain. They hated fascists. And here was a democratically elected government in Spain, and there was this coup by Franco, a Nazi, fascist, call it whatever you want, backed by the church. Abandoned by the U.S. Abandoned by the U.S. And the only folks who were helping them were the communists. And that's when you see the United States doing nothing while Hitler and Mussolini are taking down a democratically elected government. That enraged Jenks. And this kid who was a junior at the University of Colorado, couldn't take it anymore. He joined the party. That's what he joined. A lot of people joined for other reasons. Okay? Did he go to Spain? He did, right? He did not go to Spain. No, he did not, but he wanted to. All those kids back in those days, if you were interested in getting rights for blacks, you certainly wouldn't go to the Democratic Party <laughs> or the Southern segregationist party people control the South. In fact, those people, those party people, were the most violent anti-communist of them all. They weren't worried about the Soviet Union. They were worried about people like Clinton Jenks fighting for black civil rights. That's what they were worried about. So if you were interested in getting civil rights for blacks, you would join the Communist Party. That's who the people who were doing so. All it was was the Communist Party, the NAACP. There was nothing, where would you else, where else would you go? Uh, that's it for part one of the 29th bus anniversary. I'm Dan Himmelman, Flying Focus Video Collective. Thanks for joining us. And I'm PC Perry. To get more information from Flying Focus about our production or volunteer information, call us at 503-239-7456 or write to FFBC at flyingfocus.org. Our show times are at 503-321-5051. You can leave a message there or text at that same number.
Uh, today's crew is very small due to COVID concerns and includes Noah from Open Signal Important Community Media uh, and uh, our intrepid director, Moss Drake. Say hi, Moss. Hey, there he is. Almost all of our funding comes from donations, including for digital copies of our shows. Thank you for watching. Tune in next week at the same time for part two of the 29th anniversary.